Hey, I'm Dr. Ashley. Um, and I have Susie here. She is a local doula um, in the Hudson Valley. And we're just going to get chatting about, you know, all things doula and what you do. And I, I'd love to know, like, what got you into being a doula? Like, were you always a doula or, you know, <laughs> no, it's a journey. <laughs> okay. Tell me about um, it. That being said, it is a journey, but it's also a calling. So you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do something that you really aren't passionate about. And birth work is a calling. Um, but the journey, I was an occupational therapist beforehand. Um, I did everything. I, I worked at golf courses. I, I did everything. I was a singer, but the OT really spoke to me. Um, and then I had my first child, went back to OT teaching all the stuff and then had another child and noticed that people were calling me to come to like their sister's birth or, Hey, can you talk to my cousin about whatever? I just really, really was into birth and birth feeding and, and community things. And, um, one thing honestly just kind of led to another. And I started being called to births wow. without like, I'm, people were just like, like so literally a calling, a like literally people yeah. calling you. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. It was a figurative and a literal. Exactly. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, became a doula and, got so lucky to what I thought was being asked to go out to coffee with some friends, but they were starting a doula business and they wanted me into it. And I was in at the ground floor and we just, um, it's 10 years now. Amanda and I are doing this for 10 years together now. And it's crazy to think that it started over a cup of coffee and some people literally calling me to just help them or speak to their sister or whatever. Yeah. Um, but really it, it is, um, it is a passion. It is, it's an addiction. There's certainly an adrenaline part of it that I'm like, mm. I love it. Um, yeah. but having, you having, have to, right. Your hours are, can be crazy. There's no hours. Better love it. Baby, <laughs> there's no schedule. Babies are just like, that's so cute that you tried to plan that. And yeah. they don't care. No. Yeah. And that's another part of parenting. Like we have to just go with it. We don't have, we can't be so rigid. We have to be flexible. And that's one of the biggest lessons, like before the human even comes to the earth, they yeah. make some calls and they, I yeah. really listen to what the babies are saying and respect what their, what their message is, even in, yeah. especially in utero, because really affects the delivery. Yeah. Do you feel like yeah. being an OT first helped you like in this path? Like there's definitely you learned. Yeah. And did an yeah, OT. for sure. I mean, I'm, it was obviously like a lot of medical going for OT. Mm -hmm. Um, so having that comfort level and just the background with the vocabulary and, you know, just having that confidence to go into it and be you know, in a hospital setting and not be mm -hmm. like fearful, there's a white coat coming in or, you know, just yeah. people do have, you know, it, it, it brings their anxiety up for some yeah. people. And I'm like, I kind of liked it. I've always liked that hospital feel or yeah. um, now I like hospital and home birth feel. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I just, it, it was so helpful also with the developmental stuff too, with OT um, and certainly the body dynamics, like just any of the movements and knowing just knowing the body and what the motions are supposed to be doing and knowing how to right. follow what you should be doing safely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also your body changes so much in pregnancy. Like we say totally. sometimes day to day, it could be hour to hour and, yeah. and afterwards too. So a lot of shifting is happening and I really, you know, safety is always first in my mind. So mm -hmm. that was, well, that was drilled in for my lifeguarding days, but yeah, certainly with OT too, like you always have to have safety as consideration, no matter what. So yeah. that's something that I really feel strongly about bringing that to the table for our families. Like there's things that you just don't know, like stupid example, nothing to do with doula or OT, but um, my doula client lives right behind me down the hill and hunting season is happening now. And mm -hmm. they just moved up from Brooklyn and there's, you know, woohoo going on. Yeah. Totally. And I texted her and I was like, Hey, get a bright orange hat for your toddler when he's playing out in the yard. Oh, and she yeah. was just like, Oh my gosh. And everyone thought of that. Like, that's not even doula related. And I was like, yeah. No, it's like neighborly, but it's also, she wouldn't have known if I wasn't her doula. So yeah. just, you're always thinking about safety, whether the yeah. kid's inside or outside. <laughs> yeah. Wow. How lucky that she's right there. For, oh, it's uh, so great. It We're so blessed because when did she do? a professional musician and I can hear him practicing and it's great. I'm just like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. When does she do? She's due um, the beginning of January. So she's, okay. she's getting close. It's her second baby and she's confident and feeling great, looking great. Yeah. That's awesome. Did she have a doula for her first as well? She did. She did. Okay. They knew when they moved up here, they must've been pregnant before they moved here and they, they moved up here and they were just like house doula. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. 
do you like how many clients do you guys take at a time? Cause like what happens if there's like overall? <laughs> so there's two of us, there's always Amanda and I, um, mm-hmm. and that's always like, even if she's on vacation or if my kid gets struck, there's two of us because we okay. have to live our lives. We're parents first. Um, mm-hmm. and we, we also need self-care and downtime too. So it, yeah. it's a nice rotation between the two of us. That being said, due to COVID, there are some positive things that have actually come out of this is that doulas, the whole birth world has to work smarter. And we mm-hmm. now have two backup doulas that we really trust so much. Um, in the 10 years that Amanda and I have done doula work, we've had to call one of them for oh, okay. somebody who is prodroming. They weren't even an actual labor, but they needed a doula. And I was at a birth and Amanda was, I believe, sick. So we could like, we physically couldn't be with the mom and I needed to yeah. be with my mom physically. So we yeah. called in our backup to just be supportive mm-hmm. to the mom. But That's other than awesome. that, yeah, we've always, we've, I need to knock wood now. We've been there like for each time, but we do have backups and every doula should have a really good backup because okay. life happens. Yeah. Storms and happen. do, do the backups get to meet the um, client prior? Like do yeah, or they it's, just it's, are aware of them? Or something. Yeah, we tell we tell everybody right off the bat during the interviews that we have the backup doulas also. But if something's happening, like for example, Amanda's going to Disney in the beginning of December because mm-hmm. she's waited for two years to go back to mm-hmm. Disney now. And so we have already like cleared that with the other doulas in the background. And then also um when we know we have a client in that window, we're having them communicate with them as well. Sorry, I have my my doulas are, my, my, they're popping up right now. My no. messages, sorry. <laughs> That's awesome. They hear you talking about them. I know. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. So what's that you had said that the um, client was not in labor, but they were, did you say drumming? Pro drumming. Pro drumming. What's labor? That? It's not, I don't want to call it practice for nothing. Cause it, it, it's, it can be very tiring. It can wear a mom out, but you're get the baby's not in the best position. So they're just getting themselves into a better position. And that might take days. And that is actually contractions that are not okay. opening the mom up, but they're yeah. getting the baby in a good position. And they're maybe they're opening her up a little bit, but not like putting her into active labor when the baby's yeah. actually in a good position. That's when we know we're going to like, things are going to take off. But if she's pro drumming, she's actually kind of wearing herself out a little bit if she's not sleeping and not getting electrolytes. Um, and that's a concern for us because you've had kids too. Yeah. You need, you need your energy to go into it and, and finish the job. So yeah. yeah. When somebody's programming, we keep like a lot of communication going with them and giving them a lot of hints and suggestions about how to take care of themselves before, because again, going back to COVID um, at first we weren't allowed anywhere. We were blocked out of hospitals and we weren't going to homes for the obvious reasons. Um, so we were doing tons of texting support and phone and video. So yeah. if someone's programming for quite a while. We do want them to check in with their, with their provider, with their midwife and be like, what, you know, what else can we do? Because there is a time and a place for therapeutic rest. Um, if the mom just goes into active labor, great baby's in a good position we can do it. Yeah. But how do you know, like, how do you know the difference between what do they feel Um, or what's going on? So it usually peters out like nature knows when to put the brakes on for the most part. Some people can have like more activity when the sun goes down because the daylight affects our oxytocin and it's, mm-hmm. we're part of nature. So it, it does mm-hmm. tend to ramp up at night, which is when we try to sleep. So the moms mm-hmm. aren't getting enough sleep. And then the sun comes up and they're pooped out and they're like, and then they span out. So maybe they were having contractions every like four minutes, but at it night. wasn't active labor and they weren't, it wasn't getting bigger or more. And there wasn't any discharge. It was just exhausting mm-hmm. them. So, so how is this different than Braxton Hicks? Braxton Hicks is more of like a, that is more of a practice where the, like, you'll see the whole belly tightening, but there's okay. no rhyme or pattern. There's no rhythm to it whatsoever. It's just like, Hey, I turned around and, Oh, I had a Braxton Hicks and, and I'm aware of it. The other ones okay. you're like aware of them and you're breathing through them and you're like slowing yourself down. You're like, okay, I think I'm in labor. And then you're not. And then you're not meaning they aren't getting closer together like, right. okay, there's, there's not smaller exactly. gaps. Yeah, there's them. great. Yeah, it's not so ramping typically, up. Typically, okay. okay, so then those are more like how long would those contractions last and the gaps in between compared to like, oh, this is active labor. I should probably be getting to where I need to be, whether it's home, we're there, or right, right. Um, 
those are the ones that there there's again there's not like a super good rhythm or pattern but they're exhausting so if somebody is saying for the past six hours um every, like there was eight minutes apart there was four minutes apart there's no rhythm to it or pattern so we we know that the baby's not in a good position so we got to wait until the baby's in a better position sometimes mm-hmm. the baby just does it on their own sometimes we're giving them positions that they can do with like body positions cat cow yeah um any of the spinning babies just yeah you know whatever whatever we can do um and again if it gets to the point where they're exhausted we need to talk to their providers because they are going to go into a marathon depleted and that's yeah, totally yeah that's yeah. when we're like thank god for modern medicine and you know yeah things helping out that way but that's again there's always a time and a place for that is that typically when people say i had like three days of labor because it started out with the drumming versus or the, the drumming. It's it pro, depends. Like some people have induction. Is it pro drumming? Can you how do pro drumming? Yeah, pro drumming. Calling um, it drumming. Bada, 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 bada. The baby's like, I'm figuring <laughs> it out. <laughs> Please, baby. <laughs> We're like, if you're feeling jazz hands, we just want them like down and head. That's what we want. Yeah, we don't I want know, this. Right? <laughs> Um, no, there's, I mean, there's inductions that can take three days. There's, Mm -hmm. we've had, we've had inductions where it, the parents are doing everything for at least two days. One of them just a month or two ago, we had a placenta client who was in an induction for three days. They didn't contact me. I was getting a little nervous, quite honestly. And then a few days later, they contacted me and said, oh, they, they stopped our induction and sent us home for 11 days. And I was like, okay, random, Mm -hmm. but that's what it took. They weren't ready. The baby wasn't ready. So their their induction was exhausting and it definitely messes with someone's mind when you, you think that you're going through that. Um, that's hard, but then why did they they induce the the mom? Why did they induce? Good question. That's up to the provider. And that was not at a hospital that we typically go to. So she was a a placenta client. She wasn't a doula client. So I didn't have like the intimate relationship that that I yeah. Yeah. I was just okay. waiting for the organ and I was just like, where's that placenta? And they were like, oh, they put that on hold and we're going to go back in a week or so. And I was like, amazing. Um, yeah. I wow. had never actually heard of someone being induced and yeah. for a few days and then actually being home. sent home, which is amazing. Right. Like they didn't need, I mean, it's nicer than them saying we need to C-section, I guess. Exactly. Do you know what I'm saying? Yep. Like, that's why I'm saying. I haven't heard that. Yeah path yet I was a thrilled when I was shocked and thrilled when I heard that because mm-hmm. you're right it's usually it would be like well she's um, Amanda likes to say like it's like going to a restaurant and not getting service like you show up at a hospital you want your baby and the staff there is trained to help you get your baby so mm-hmm. they were just it was an unusual circumstance I'm thrilled that it happened that way it worked out for that family they're very happy um but yeah they went back like either nine or 11 days later. And she had a vaginal birth after a second induction. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. I was, I was over the moon for them. I was like, you beat all the statistics. I'm so happy. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So now as a doula, like what there's different kinds of doulas, right? Like uh, prenatal postpartum in like, are they all during the birth or some just one Some or the are other. just postpartum. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's actually something that Amanda and I feel very strongly about. There's a huge need for postpartum doulas. Um, totally. a huge need. I mean, our village is no longer with a virus and I know that things are a little yeah. bit lighter in this area because of the high vaccination rate, but it's still not the same as when it was before COVID. Like yeah. we have big high risks and little tiny humans. So people take mm-hmm. it very seriously. So their village is not there. So postpartum yeah. doula is a really great idea for a family. Um, that being said, Amanda and I feel very strongly that our specific skill set is exceptional for birthing and the prenatal. Mm-hmm. And okay. if we want, if somebody wants a postpartum, we have packages where we have a postpartum and that looks very different for every single family. Um, but if they want like a package of postpartums, we would actually refer out to a postpartum specific doula because then they just have, they can schedule things. They can say, oh, I can block you in for four to six hours, these certain days where Amanda and I are like busier birthing doulas. And we want to, our, our top priorities are, are birthing families. So I can't be like, Hey, I'm, I would feel terrible saying like, I'm going to meet you for your postpartum and I'll be there to support you for four to six hours and then cancel. So I would rather. Right. Cause you get called into a birth. You can, Yeah. Right. 
Exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. Cool. So, and that so is, you that guys is... specialize in prenatal and the birth day of the birth. Yeah. And then days, obviously days like, of the birth. Yeah. yeah. Day, exa- exactly. Um, and then of course, like the immediate postpartum stuff with like recovery, um, pelvic floor and, um, breastfeeding, all that stuff is very high on our list. And there's not okay. a single hospital that I go into now where I'm not within the first hour talking about, we're obviously talking about breastfeeding, but postpartum care for the perinatal perineal area and yeah. pelvic floor. And I'm like, well, you had a vaginal birth, so you're coming back in six weeks, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't pick up the phone. If there's an issue, that's what your providers are here for. Yeah. And many of the midwives now, especially at certain local hospitals are really on board with that. They're like kind of recognizing that our society or our country, unfortunately is failing moms postpartum. Yeah. Oh and it God. is, I, I don't totally. mean to generalize or stereotype, but if the man had a baby, grew it, birthed it, no matter how they birthed it, there would be a script for a pelvic floor PT. Yeah. I mean, 100%. it would just be a whole different world. <laughs> Yes, it would be. And I like, I'm not, yeah. I, I love my partner. I respect him, but yeah. it's, it's just something that I feel very strongly that women are just like, you're good. Oh, good. Call us. Mm-hmm. If you need anything, we'll see you in six weeks. Yeah. That is, that's unfortunate and unfair. And I just think it's a big disgrace to the, um, our future, our families yeah. and everything. So yeah. yeah, you don't want, you don't need a prolapse from just a good sneeze when you're, you know, 60 years old. And that's not normal. It's not normal to mm-hmm. walk on your, your curb and pee yourself. Or, you know, chase your toddler and and be like, yeah, somebody actually said, they're like, did I just fart through my vagina? And I was like, you may have, you um, might have, (laughs) you might. Yeah. But we're going to, we're going to hook you up with Dr. Ashley. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Whether it was queefing or like, is like, what if there was actual like opening from right to the vagina and they need to go back? Exactly. Yeah. And we're super cautious with how we're pushing and and the length of time that we're pushing and not pushing. Even if you're 10 centimeters, you don't need to push unless your baby is really saying it's time to come out. And then Mm -hmm. you're involuntarily pushing your body knows what to do, but just because you're 10 does not mean you should start pushing. We like to labor Mm -hmm. down as often as possible to let the tissue stretch. So we have way less recovery and issues. And that was part of my issue. And I didn't have a doula because I didn't know any better. And I was not a pelvic floor physical therapist yet. So, and I was like really good at pushing. Yeah. I was really probably from all my constipation issues as a kid. And so um, I was like, I just need to get this baby out. And I push, like push and push. And And you can damage um, yourself. And I did, I actually had a pisiotomy and tour because my doctor, like she tried the olive oil stretch. I'm like, first of all, now I know like that does nothing at the time of birth. That should have been done prior, like for me to prepare myself, but that's okay. another story. And then, um, I don't think she even asked. She just kind of sniffed me and like, you know, opened, I was still pushing and like, there was like no support, like no direction. No, you know, I just went in there knowing nothing. Were you on your back? I mean, I was on my back. Yeah. Uh, I basically probably birthed in just a few pushes. It was like 20 minutes of, it was like, I got to my, the hospital. You're a good pusher. I'm a good pusher. I got there 10 centimeters dilated, ready to push. Like I should have birthed in the car on my 40 minute drive there. (laughs) I know I was like, I didn't want to get sent home. I was like that person who's like, I am (laughs) not going. I don't want to go home. Unless like this is happening. Yeah. Um, If you can see the ears, you're not going home. You're going to have that baby. (laughs) So yeah, I'm like, oh man. I mean, now, you know, I've had two like natural vaginal births. And if I were to have any more children not happening, I would definitely be hiring a doula. <laughs> same, same. Not on purpose, not <laughs> happening on purpose. We're, we're pretty settled where we are, but like, yeah. I just wish that more people understood why having a doula is so helpful. Like, yeah, my husband was a great support. Like he was there for me. Yeah. And, but I'm like, I know that like, everyone should probably have a doula, but, and you're probably biased to that too, obviously a a, a small (laughs) amount, but tell me some reasons that maybe you're aware of that. Like, like just what are all the benefits of having a doula actually like prenatal and during the birth? Like what's like, let me just, let me just hit something that you just mentioned before. You're like, my partner was really helpful. What, um, a lot of people do is unintentionally put a lot of extra expectations and pressure on their partner who 90% of the time does not have a uterus, has never had menstrual cramps, 
and is our partner. They've never gone yeah. to a birth. They, 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 we put unreasonable expectations on our partners, unfortunately, yeah. and they are, they do their best. They do their reading. They go to the classes, they talk to us, they get us, you know, they help us with our nesting and all that stuff. And sometimes when it happens, when like birth is not textbook, you had a relatively like amazing butter birth. It sounds like you got there, you pushed a baby out. Mm-hmm. I would love for you not to tear, um, you know, episiotomy is a different story, but do that so fast and furious, but, but whatever. I mean, it's just, but like you had a really great experience. There's people that mm. fall apart and their partners are scared. And that's yeah. something that's really holding the birth up. Like when yes. we know that the partner is taken care of with, yeah. even if it's just extra information, which is so helpful yeah. to them, they feel supported. They feel like this is normal because it is. Yeah. And they're not anxious. So then the mom is able to go off and labor and do her thing. Yeah. It is so helpful for the partner and for the mom. So just, yeah, because that's like contagious energy. You like absorb other people's energies. And if your partner's flipping their shit because they're like, yeah, they want to be protected to my beloved partner. And then that energy is going to feed onto. Yeah, totally. And when I say my husband was supportive, he's like really good at just kind of like silently sitting there watching. And like, if I said, do something or don't do something, it would be like, I would, I will, or I won't. Right. Um, and there was no sign that he was worried because he's, I don't know, maybe he's just like really good at holding stuff back because he probably had thoughts in his head and he, but he didn't allow that to like, or I just blocked it out. I don't know what it was, but I love how you said it's like, it's about like helping everyone feel safe and supported and just like less scared. I'm going to let Amanda also, in because she's ready to come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For meeting. Yeah, absolutely. Let's pause for a second and let her in. <clears throat> Make sure she, Amanda, I see you. I don't see you. If you can, uh, I'm going to ask you to start your video and then make sure you're unmuted. another 20 minutes of figuring out the mute thing. <laughs> Can you hear us, Amanda? I'm asking you to start your video. I sent you a little thing. Hopefully you can figure this out. Well, we'll see if it, if she uh, pops in with her video or whatnot. Um, okay. Um, so number one, it's like supporting both the partner. Both. And- yeah. I think that's a big misconception when people go and look at doulas, yeah. they kind of assume that it's mostly for the birthing person and then are very surprised re- to realize after the fact that they were very supportive themselves. Mm. One of our clients years ago was just like, wow, that was amazing. That was like almost like 70% for me and 30 for her. And I was like, well, okay, maybe I, I didn't see it that way, but if you felt <laughs> that way, okay. <laughs> Not a, like not a mom's not gonna, it's yeah. so, it was so funny, but we know like a mom's not going to push her baby out if her partner's bladder is full and they're texting updates to their entire family and they're being taken away from their space. This is their birth too. So we have mm. big talks with our families beforehand of like, what do they, what are their wishes? What are their goals? Like, what's, what's a good idea to keep family informed and like when, because it is a big distraction to have like well-meaning, loving family members who cannot wait to meet this new human. But if there's interfering with the process yeah. of it, like it's, we have all these talks beforehand so that our families are like really comfortable and they're not like nobody's family is, we like to call them like butt hurt the day of the birth because they have been talked to and, and they have their expectations. They know what their roles are already yeah. for both during and after. So it's really kind of nice. It's just like a smoother flow for everybody. Yeah. And then like, they're able to be fully present, which yeah. you need to be. Yeah. You know? Like when a, when a mom is going through transformation or transition and she's chattering her teeth and her whole body is shaking, or maybe she's vomiting a lot of partners get fearful. And if they know Mm -hmm. ahead of time, that this is all completely normal. They're, they're doing, they're holding the cool compress because we're giving them ones because that's another thing that we try to really do is not have, um, we don't want pictures of us working with the mom. We want pictures or any kind of memory for the the couple that this was their birth. So I Mm -hmm. would prefer a mom to know like, Oh, I remember when my partner put the cool compress on my head and maybe they wouldn't have known to do that. But Amanda and I are like, 
here's a cold compress. This might feel good here and here. And yeah. like, let's lay it across her. Oh, I'm going to cry. It's like, like, you're these like little invisible angels that are like <laughs> feeling so- like the what to do to the partner. <laughs> like, you know, and then two, like, so there was oh, two different you. descriptions. <laughs> Somebody called us um, a birth tour guide, which was brilliant. And somebody else called us like birth witches. And I was like, I love both. It's so, I, uh, totally. it was so sweet. You the put on your like head. invisible cloak. You're like there and your energy is present. And like things are just happening. But it's awesome. such a, like the birth tour guide was so interesting to me because I, it was, I was like, oh gosh, that's great. Because yeah. if you can, you can read all the books on going to say like, I don't know, Rome. I've never been to yeah. Rome, so I'm just choosing Rome. I'll, I'll read about Rome. I'll go on YouTube and check out videos of Rome. And, I, and maybe I'll even take a few, like, brush up Duolingo things on Italian. Mm-hmm. But I am not going to hit the ground running in Rome without somebody who's actually knows what the heck is going on. Takes your hand and walks you around. Yeah. Gives me a little bit of security. Like, these are some great spots. This is what you might enjoy. Hey, I might avoid this or that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. That's a great, that was so helpful and Amanda and I are like, we love that. Thank you. I mean, people have come yeah, up with other cool. funny things too. That's They're like, so cool. don't be a fula, hire a doula. And I'm like, <laughs> that's good too. <laughs> yeah, I love it. So now Amanda popped in, your partner in crime. And crime in good. I don't oh, know what we call it. Good. Um, but yeah, do you want to introduce yourself? And I'm, I was talking to Susie before and just asking like, were you always a doula? Like what got you into being a doula? And like, you know. No, she was not always a doula, but like, tell us a little bit about your journey too, Amanda. Yeah. So I'm a doula. I'm a childbirth educator. I'm also a registered nurse. And, um, what brought me into doula work actually was the childbirth education piece. I, um, had a fantastic birth experience using hypnosis with the hypno babies program. And I thought it was such a great program that I wanted to bring it to other moms in our area because there were no live instructors in the Hudson Valley. And so I started teaching childbirth hypnosis and um, couples started saying, hey, can you come to my birth? And I was like, okay. So I was going to births and- um, We can still hear you, but your video is going to go in and out. But yeah, it just went out. I got a call. (laughs) Um, So I started going to births and- um, it became like a side gig to my nursing career. Mm. And then um, we slowly got to the point where I was having conflict between nursing and doula work. And I started needing partners to help back me up. And so that's how I fell into a business model with Susie and our previous partner court. And then we just started working together and it became busier and busier and busier. And now doula work is my primary job. So I spend most of my time supporting families in and out of hospital environments, um, doing lots of childbirth education. I use hypnosis as my main tool because Mm -hmm. it's super helpful with the mind body connection. And people think of hypnosis as this freaky weird thing. Cause they're used to stage hypnosis, but yeah, we use yeah. hypnosis all the time in our daily life. And, mm-hmm. um, we, yeah. we project things, right. We think about, okay, this is what I want to do. This is how I want it to be. And that's what mm-hmm. we're doing with hypnosis is we're just right. having people use their mind to project the mm-hmm. experience of the birth that they want to have. Mm-hmm. Totally. And it's like, it's more, I mean, when you're doing, I've done some hypnosis as well. And what I've been told is just like a deeper level of meditation where your mind is more accepting of suggestions of how you might want things to be. Exactly. And like we go into hypnosis doing things as simple as driving in the car. If you're on a route, right. You get into your car, you put on music and you drive to the place Mm -hmm. you're planning on going. And before you know it, you're at your destination. You don't even remember the drive. I know. Isn't that because, like kind of scary when you're like, yeah, I don't remember driving here. I How got here so safely and wonderful. Yeah. But like, yeah. Oh <laughs> yeah. And that's yeah. what we're doing in hypnosis is we're putting your mind into a place where you can still focus on what you're doing, but you're not concentrating on things like the discomfort. You're not yeah. focusing on the tangible things in the room. And it's really interesting because it taps right into the natural process of birth. Um, women that don't take hypno babies with me also wind up 
self-hypnotizing because birth is rhythmic. They go into a trance, they fall into a pattern. And so the brain is really susceptible to hypnosis, regardless of whether they're trained in it or not. Cool. For birth. I love yeah. that. That's awesome. So do you do the hypnosis with the moms during prenatal, like birth preparation stuff and at the birth, do you help them with that? Right. So just we have before. a six week childbirth education program with hypno babies. So right. they can formally train with that. And then yes, while we're at the birth, I use hypnosis. It's positive suggestions. It's positive yeah. language. Right. It's instead of saying things like contraction, which we all know is supposed to be painful. It's supposed to be scary. It's something that induces fear. We say birthing wave or pressure wave or surges mm-hmm. because those are still powerful sensations, but they don't invoke fear. And so so subconsciously it creates a different, a positive connotation to the experience. And you can Mm -hmm. see like everybody has seen an ocean wave and sometimes they're gentle, sometimes they're bigger Mm -hmm. and um, having the training that it's such a powerful tool, honestly. Um, But having the visual of what the waves look like, you don't have to Mm. fight a wave. If you fight a wave, you usually wind up yeah. With a bathing suit full of sand. And yeah, you, you just know, have to like, like kind of go with it until right. you're like, you, yeah. 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 I got caught so. in a really big wave in Hawaii once. I was like, oh, do yeah. I swim away from it? Like, do I swim into it or into the, you know, just ride it? Or, and I, it, I, it was too late. And this wave was a few stories high. It was like insane. And I was just in the water. I wasn't surfing or anything. I don't surf. Yeah. I tried once. It wasn't good. Um, anyways. And <laughs> It was scary, but like, I knew that I just, if I tried to get out of it, I, it would be worse. And like, I just have to let it tumble me in the sand. And then when it, when it feels like calm, I will come out of this. Yeah. And I did and it was fine. But like, that is what that brought up for me was like, yeah, some ways are like fun and fine. (laughs) And some ways are like, yeah. Oh, shit. Holy moly. But you know, waves, I like the term because you know, waves like they do always come to like a calming spot in place and they're they just like and it's past level they level out and And like there might be more coming but eventually the winds dive down and like you know yeah and there's also a purpose to them I think when people like that's another misunderstanding Mm -hmm. with like with um our society basically like they they use the word pain and it's pressure because pain is a toothache pain is a backache a kidney stone you either pass the kidney stone and you're not in pain or you get some really good drugs and you're not in pain that's not how birthing is like birthing nature builds in these like calm times to give you the break because it's not constant like it's just it's Mm -hmm. just birth and I hate to say it's just birth but it's natural. It's not, mm-hmm. it's not a pain stimulus. It's, it's a different word, but we don't have a word. Amanda has always said like, we don't have a word in our language that really gives the good, accurate description because pain isn't it. It's pressure. Mm-hmm. It's big. Of course. So we don't, we just don't have the word. So people say, Oh, it was painful, but pain mm-hmm. in our pain is like a toothache doesn't come and go. It's there until it's taken care of. It's constant, it's like but that's not a labor. super strong sensation that requires all of your concentration to get through. Mm -hmm. Right. And you can get through one and breathe through it and that's okay. But then when they come again and then they come again and then they come Mm -hmm. again, eventually you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. Right. Sometimes the mindset is like that. And um, if we just had a mom experience one, even the strong ones, they would be like, wow, that's a lot. And Mm -hmm. now it's done and I feel normal. Right. Yeah. When they come again and again, that's the part that a lot of people um, have difficulty with. And I found that, well, Susie and I both found that if moms sleep in the beginning when it's mild and they're able to get sleep, they have the stamina to withstand it later in their birth and they can do way better with all of the sensations they're experiencing. Hi, Sebastian. Yeah. Yeah, He's like loving me right now. That was probably... That was probably really helpful in when you say the sleeping, because I did sleep for like at least a solid hour or two 
when it first started. I was like, mm, it's kind of annoying, crampy stuff. I'm just going to go to sleep. Go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, we're we very upfront with all of our clients. Like we have expectations and we would love for them to all do hypno babies. It may not resonate with every family, but it is mm-hmm. such a good tool. And I can't stress mm-hmm. enough that it is not just for birth. I'm not a hypno babies instructor. I, I, I literally gain nothing monetarily from hypno babies, but the fact that it gives the family such a great foundation to go into their birth with um, the rest that they need, with the belief in their bodies, with the, yeah. the knowing that this is normal. And yeah. it's there. They're, we have midwives all over the place. They're like, your moms are so prepared and they're so calm. Mm-hmm. And, and they're like, even before you guys get here. And I'm like, well, you know, we're, we educate them and we give them a ton of support before they even show up to the hospital. But I know I can tell which families a a hypno babies family or not just by like the level of comfort that they're getting beforehand. And confidence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not just during the birth. So like you got to sleep for a couple hours. Most of the time people call us and they're like, my water broke and their adrenaline is up and now they're not sleeping. But our hypno babies moms are like, my water broke. I know what to do. And we're, you know, we're communicating but they're going to bed. They know exactly yeah. what to do. They trust and they trust us to, to not bamboozle them or tell them any nonsense because we're like, sleep. You have to yeah. sleep. And we yeah. tell them from the very first interview, these are our expectations. So yeah. Yeah. it's hard for some people. It's hard. They're excited. They cannot wait to meet their human, but their human might not come for 24 to 36 hours. So yeah. please get some sleep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the stronger sensations will wake them up. If it's like, if they're worried about nobody slept through have, their birth, you know, I have not <laughs> had anyone meet and miss their labor yet. Yeah. yeah. Like, like, I just, slept through it. just totally slept through a baby came out. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah. That'd be awesome. Um, right. Also, also like if they can't sleep, sleep, there's something called pretend sleep where you lay yeah. there very still, your eyes are closed. You keep mm-hmm. your breathing. Even you stay calm. Maybe you drift a little mm-hmm. bit, but not sleep and that's okay. Or watch a movie that you've seen yeah. 10, 10,000 times. That, that puts you in like a trance. You. Yeah. Yeah. Puts totally. you into a trance. It keeps you relaxed. And if you did fall asleep and you woke up to a movie, you've seen 10,000 times, you're not lost in the movie. Nothing yeah. with lots of adrenaline. You want something really calm, really light. Bob you want to keep it soft. Bob, yeah. Bob Ross. Ross. Happy act. Bob Ross. Yeah. Yeah, they're legally. Blonde. Blonde. I, you know, I dressed up as Bob Ross for Halloween this year. My husband and I both did. He was did, did one Bob of you Ross. wear like? I was technically like the painting, the and painting, then he was Bob yeah. Ross. But I still wanted the hair, so I had to like because it's put the awesome. Hair on too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we I, both one of my other friends did that, and I was like, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so, so great, but no, somebody something like yeah. that where it's so Rhythmic zen and, and chill. Yeah. And, some families want to do like listen to ASMR channels or whatever is going to be helpful for them. Yeah. Um, I'd probably be throwing in some meditation. Like I just need to a sleep meditation right now. So I can like focus on that. And then I'm always out. And that's, that's fine for certain families, but we just, there's also like a, people who hire doulas, they want more information. They want to know all the stuff and they deserve to know all the stuff. It's their bodies. So I do feel strongly that the hypno babies gives them like a really great foundation. Of course they can always like text Amanda and I, is this normal? And if it's not, we're yeah. like text your provider. Um, but that's, those are the steps. Like they feel confident in themselves and this whole process of what's about to happen and it is happening. It's not just like a switch flips and all of a sudden you're in labor and having a baby. There's days going into this and weeks, like Amanda and I are constantly getting check-ins for our families and we're like, yeah. okay, now we can put this one in our window of like, we need to pay more attention and, and like clear our schedules maybe. And just because of the frequent check-ins and yeah. And, and what they're sharing with us, they know, they know what's to be expected and, and what we need. So when someone hires you guys, they have like access to text messages and whatnot, like from when to when, like, what do they get as your when they, our minimum minimum requirement is after every prenatal visit. That's the minimum. We expect them to check in at least that frequently. Oh, okay. Then in in addition, if they have a body change that they're noticing that they want to have insight on, maybe they're noticing they're carrying and their back is leaning more forward and they need like a maternity band. 
Maybe Mm -hmm. they need to discuss having a peanut ball to help them sleep at 35 weeks because their hips are more achy. So -hmm. like anytime they notice a body change that we can help them with, or even emotional stuff. Like if we know that a parent is having issues with mom or mother-in-law, okay, we know we need to help them understand boundaries and help them figure out ways to set expectations so that that during their birth, they don't have to worry about mom walking in while their legs are in stirrups, things like that. Um, Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Or even like if there's a toddler at home, like there's so many things that people, you know, we have quite a few moms with toddlers now and they're like, Oh my God. And sometimes they just want one event and that's fine. Yeah. Like we've all, we've done it too. We fully understand. We get it. And sometimes yeah. they need to cry. Sometimes they need to complain about their job or their partner or whatever, or the partner calls us and they're like, she's having a terrible day. Can you guys just reach out? That's yeah. Like unload. We're fine. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So we're also so marriage when- counselors. Yeah. Hmm? Wow. <laughs> okay. So can I hire you? If I'm not yeah. pregnant, yeah, sure, why not? Just to text you, <laughs> like when I'm stressing, because yeah. that sounds awesome. So when do when do people usually hire you? Like at what stage in their labor? Like, do you start? On the are they like I'm pregnant and don't tell anyone yet? I'm in my, you know, but you're my Sometimes. doula, and then do they can they start texting you then, or is it like let's not start like until this, like when? When does that communication? It depends on I'm the I'm assuming family. you have to have boundaries for yourself too, because you have your family. Families. And your uh, yeah. Lives. Yeah. We're, we're finally getting better at that now. Amanda and I have, again, right off the bat with our interviews, we do say like, at the minimum, we want you to be texting us when after each prenatal, please be respectful of the time that we, it's, it's not just family time. We're actually sleeping for births. So if somebody mm. texts us at like 10 30 at night because their baby has hiccups, it's adorable. But if we're already sleeping for a birth, now our phones bang and we're like, our adrenaline goes up and we can't get it down for a good two hours because of chemicals. So we'd really, really try to tell everybody like what is best. Like no one wants a tired doula showing up at their birth. So they're all very understanding that they, if it's a, if it's something that can wait until the next morning, they are, they're wonderful. They're waiting until like business hours, which is great. Yeah. If okay. something is changing rapidly, if their bodies are, you know, if they, it's their birthing time, there's no business hours. It's like babies on, you know, babies making the yeah. call and we're, we're there. Um, Amanda and I have worked out now where we're like, say the family's chosen a primary doula, that primary doula is actually sleeping and the backup doula is texting and doing all that kind of support so that the primary doula is going to be rested when they physically oh, show up to that family because you smart. can't you can't exhaust yourself that's just dangerous and then it's yeah it takes about two days for us to do a full recovery for ourselves and yeah. that might look like you know getting a chair massage or getting like chiropractic or whatever whatever that looks like for us yeah. we have to take care of ourselves too yeah um, so it, that means before and during and after the birth too like our body dynamics play a big part in how we work too we don't want to yeah. injure ourselves Totally. Yeah, that's smart. That's so good. But wow, you guys like that's awesome. Everyone and hiccups are way well. cuter at two p.m. than they are at ten thirty. Word. Yeah. Oh man, just show me a hiccup <laughs> at two in the afternoon. That's my afternoon pick me up. But ten thirty, I'm like, that's. You're like, dude. I now I can't go back. I know. Then. I'm like Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes Amanda. Because that's I when they're like, doing their hiccups. I know, when but sometimes surprised. Amanda and I will like get off of the phone and like just call each other and just look at each other, and then just we can we can hang up just to to, <laughs> to make the eye contact. So, you know, we're like, like you're awake too. I'm awake. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good luck. Who's going to bed first? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's awesome. Anything else that like you guys can think of that people like who are thinking they might need a doula or you know, not still not quite sure. You you told me like so many awesome things that doulas are helpful for, especially like what, you know, you guys specializing in prenatal and during birth. Um, But is there anything else that like, if someone's on the fence, like, you know, if they're going to prenatal visits and they're telling their providers things that they have preferences on and the provider shows any hesitancy, disagreement, they're with the wrong provider first. Yeah. They're not being heard. And if, if they're not 
willing to change providers for whatever reason, be it insurance or they like everyone else in the group, maybe that's a sign that you need an advocate or somebody Mm. nearby that can help you know when it's policy that hospitals adhere to or law that the state mandates or convenience for the providers, because they don't always make it sound like it's a choice. They say, Hey, put this gown on, go in the bathroom and give me a urine sample. Well, what if you don't want to wear the hospital gown that they have because it's scratchy and your butt hangs out the back end? Maybe you want to wear something a little different and that's not a a rule. It is a policy and it can be broken. So like, let's Mm. talk about what you can wear. So like, we're there to help advocate for everything from that to, you know, the cafeteria closes at seven o'clock at night and your baby's going to be born probably eight 39. Maybe we should order a tray at six o'clock, even though you don't have regular diet orders so that when you're done having your baby, there's food for you. Like we think about things ahead of time. We help anticipate yeah. needs. We help you discover that you can ask for a peanut ball to help keep your pelvis open at the hospital. We help you realize that you don't have to lay on your back with your legs up right. in stirrups. You can have your mm-hmm. baby laying on the side or sitting and that's, upright. That's yeah. not just because people are uneducated or whatever. Like we actually had a, a family, both of them were doctors. One of them was working at the hospital we were delivering in. And when, when I walked in, I was, I just, we did our normal stuff. Like I set the room up and get things ready for it progressing. And they were like, I didn't even know we could do that. And they're both doctors. It's just, it's like something that what you don't know, you don't know until until it happens. And then, then you're like, Oh, but that's when we, we can come in. And we, we also, the staff tells us all the time, we help them too, because they have a ton of other patients and it makes their job easier. We, you know, we know some things now and we're trusted and, and yeah, yeah, it's, it's, that's really important for the staff to have that kind of relationship with a doula too. Um, Mind you, the staff is not hiring us. The families are, but when it works out really nicely where everybody's like, they're like, Oh, Amanda's back. And they're all like jumping up to give Amanda hugs. Yeah. That makes the families feel really nice. And they're like, yeah, hey, my doula is loved and respected. And yeah. it's just one of those nice things. Everyone like, feels calm and supported and awesome. Yeah. So yeah. do you guys ever both go to a birth together or is there usually just one? And you would Due like to COVID, it? we can't. Yeah. So yeah, we used to be able to tag team. Again, because of COVID, I said earlier, we've learned to work a lot smarter um, uh-huh. because there's, there's, our, there's a restriction on our energy too. So we can't be at a birth for like 24 hours anymore mm-hmm. and barely able to drive home and not speaking English. Right. So we really time our times as when we show up physically. And honestly, the hospitals are not keeping people if they're not in active labor. So a lot of this stuff is prior, sorry, my phone's mm-hmm. going. Um, so yeah, all that stuff is happening and we are, we don't, our intention is to not be there for 24 hours and, yeah. and the mom doesn't want to be watched for 24 hours. If they're sleeping, that's not yeah. okay. Like, so we just, we try to be a lot smarter with our time, but we have had before COVID, we did tag team a few births a couple of times. Amanda and I were both there. Yeah. Um, whether it was like, you know, she had a mom down the hallway and I had another mom or we were both like, you need a break. I'm going to come in after 15 hours to relieve you. And then you go home and I'll finish the birth, whatever. But now it's one doula for the the patient and that's it. Okay, cool. Do you ever do just like virtual stuff or I mean, I'm assuming through COVID you had to like make a shift, but like our first, yeah, our first virtual from COVID was, um, they were stationed over in Turkey and they were like, I hope the time difference isn't a big dif- deal. And I was like, babies don't care. It's, what's You're the like, time this difference is our to a baby? Anyway, actually yeah. it might work out better. <laughs> it was so interesting. Yeah. And it was, it was her second birth. The, the father wanted more support than the mom and it just, it worked out and they were very clear about what their needs were. And I still get pictures now. The baby's what, baby was born in the beginning of COVID. So they're. Wow. So they the were over in Turkey too. and then you yeah. guys. That's so cool. And so there's not like regulations as to like, um, they like were just your license or certification or, or anything with like state to state or country to country, like practicing. 
right? No, there's not so a doulas are, have that. doulas are not a regulated industry. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And, and so, so there's no licensure her. issues. And it's because we're not medical people, medical. technically. Yeah. We are there for emotional and physical support, um, education and advocacy, but we're not there yeah. to make sure that we decide when and when Pitocin is not used. And right. So it's more just like coaching. It's so if somebody is in another state or country and is like, I want Amanda and Susie and or Susie to be my doula virtually, they can, anyone can. Yeah. yeah we, have can. A, we have a client that moved down to Tampa and she's, I mean, she's always saying she's going to have another baby, but she's, she's going to be the virtual person. She'll, she'll, she will hunt. I'll be in that birth somehow, whether she, she might even fly me down who the heck knows, but she is very attached to us. And as I am to yeah. her, and it, it is one of those things that if she does have a third baby, somehow I will be involved in it. Absolutely. Even if it's, yeah. you know, virtually it's fine. So like COVID had some good things that came out of it, you know, being able to. That it really, there, there was always a silver yeah. lining. Yeah. <laughs> but that was, yeah, yeah, cool. that was one of them. We, we learned to work a lot smarter for the two of us, for our mm-hmm. personal health and safety. Yeah. And, um, it made it better for our clients too, because we, we could say like, this is what we have established and what our expectations are. And everybody's just like, wow, okay, that's great. There's really not like a lot of gray areas. Yeah. Of course, there's a lot of gray when it comes to the birthing time. Cause yeah, you have to just be flexible. There's no plans, mm-hmm. but just like getting there and how we bond and our, our, like our relationship with the families getting into it. It's, it's important for people. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they're like, you can come later on. It's fine. But whatever their comfort level is, we're there. Cool. I love it. So how can people like get in touch with you and find you? What's your, uh, our, our website on has a contact a box. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. Our, our, our phone numbers are on our site. What's your well. website? HudsonRiverDoulas.net. Dot net. Okay, cool. And what's your Instagram? I don't know. Hudson oh my River goodness. Doulas, Somebody, come on, guys. <laughs> Somebody tell us our... We I, give, it's Hudson River Doulas. send it over. It's Hudson River Doulas. Okay. Uh, it, it, yeah. That <laughs> is, I'm going to look real quick. <laughs> look it up. We don't want to be given false information. <laughs> It's just Hudson River doulas as far as I understand. I didn't okay. add anything extra. Yeah. <laughs> Hudson River doulas.net and then yep. at Hudson River doulas. Okay. Yeah, for Instagram. And all your yeah. info's there. That way it's people all there. watching this can find you. Yeah. yeah. We're definitely you. upping the social aspect and every now and then we'll have like a family that's like, yes, you should share this picture. And we're so grateful because um, yeah. it is a very special time to be invited to someone's birthing time. Um, so we don't want to, I would love to come to someone's birth, just be a fly on the wall. It's such a cool thing to be present for. It really is is because it's amazing. It's like the, that's the moment that whatever deity you believe in, I feel like we're closest to that deity Mm. in that moment when a whole soul comes out of someone else's body and to just be present, to have the family become a family. And like the roles now there's a, there's two different parents and they, like a lot of times the mom is like, I know I'm a mom, but the partner may not fully grasp it until Mm. the head and shoulders are out. And they're like, that's my human. And we get to see that. We get to see that Mm -hmm. person become the parent. And it's like such a gift that we get to see. It's, it's something that most other people can't share that unless they're an L and D. Yeah. It's uh, we, yeah, we're very grateful to be a part of that. Awesome. You guys are the best. Thanks for chatting. Thank yeah, you. It was great connecting with you. I'm sorry. I yeah. had to be a few minutes late. I was with That's mama. okay. That's You're okay. fine. Mama's, You're fine. mama's first. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, all right, ladies. Thank you so all much. Right. I'm sure all we'll right. be chatting again. See you soon. Right. Hopefully. All right. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.